Okay, uh, Dr. Abhijit, uh, I think we, we can start now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, Dr. Gandhi? Yeah. Yeah. So we'll be starting now. Um, so, welcome everybody, all the participants. We welcome you to the series of lectures on DBT Shine Shetu program. So, today, we have Dr. Shonu Gandhi, one of the most promising young women scientists in India. I'll briefly uh, talk about her uh, biodata. Dr. Gandhi obtained her PhD from CSIR Imtech Chandigarh. She worked as a postdoctoral fellow subsequently in uh, Milan, Italy, and later she worked as a visiting scientist at University of Washington, USA. And before joining NIAB, she also worked as assistant professor in Amity University, Noida, India. Dr. Gandhi's research experience spans from development of biosensing probes for clinical and nutritional applications, chemical modifications of biomolecules for generation of specific antibodies against antibiotics, pesticides, toxins, or clinically important diseases, discovery of novel biomarker for design of efficient, affordable, and cost-effective lab on chip, and development of novel nanomaterials for targeted drug delivery and therapeutics. She has numerous research articles of, in, published in very good international journals. So far, 50 research articles, 12 book chapters, and eight patents. And she has got multiple awards, national, international awards, some of them are ACRB, a DST Sharp Women Excellence Award in 2021. She's the elected member of Indian National Young Academy of Sciences, elected as the Association of Indian Academy of Sciences. She received Tech Exhibition Award at IKM 2020. Also, Sharp Early Career Award, DBT Biocare Women Scientist Award, and name a few. So, I welcome Dr. Gandhi for today's Science Shetu lecture. Please, Dr. Gandhi. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bappa. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, I hope it is visible now. Yes. OK. Uh, so good morning to one and all. I hope the students will get benefit with this talk. And if you have any questions, you can post me anytime. So today I will discuss about the nanomaterials, how we can use it for the diagnostic and the therapeutic tools. So uh, in this talk, I would first describe about uh, what are the sensors and uh, what are the basic components of sensors and what is the uh, working of the sensors and what are the different types and uh, later the uh, little uh, glimpse about the applications and further uh, some of the research which uh, we are carrying at NIAB. So uh, what is biosensor? First of all, it's very in, uh, inter interesting to understand that the biosensor consists of a bioreceptor, which could be your enzymes, antibodies, microorganisms, or any molecules like cells or the viruses, bacteria, whatever you would like to uh, uh, diagnose. Then on the surface of these bioreceptors, you put on analytes. These are specific analytes for these bioreceptors that I will describe later in the slides. Then the second component comes in picture is the transducer. The, these transducers could be uh, uh, used on the basis of the applications that we would like to use. Like a, if you would like to use the electroactive substances or the you would like to test on the basis of the change in the pH, heat, light, or change in the mass. So as per your requirement, we design the 
sensor. So if you are checking the electroactive substances, then you, you should design the electrochemical sensors or the pH-based sensors, thermistors for the heat-based sensors or the photoelectrode-based sensors or piezoelectric devices. After designing these transducers, the, the, the next component comes in picture is the detector. So how you would like to detect your signal? You would like to detect in the form of a reading or you would like to detect uh, in the form of a scan. So as, as per your need, we design the sensors. So how this concept of biosensors came into the picture? So the professor uh, Clark in 1956 was identified the concept first and he designed the oxygen electrode which came into reality in 1962. And the, uh, then after that, the microbial electrode was invented in 1975. And this was the first immunosensor designed. Later on, there was a, a series of sensors that has been discovered in the future. Uh, then it was in 1983, 1987, the most uh, recognizable or the most useful sensor is the blood glucose biosensor, which is still is under lot of developmental processes and various companies are making and I will give you a glimpse about that too. And in the era of 2000, the nanotechnology uh, era was uh, basically um, uh, invented in the form of a biosensors. Uh, I would say the different kinds of sensors in the form of a lab on chip, organs on chip, by using various kinds of nanomaterials. So the, if uh, we would like to design the nucleic acid-based biosensors, the first thing is that we need to use the probe. The probe should be your single standard model. That, that when interacts with the target, it gives us the signal. Similarly, if you would like to go for the antigen antibody based sensors, the, the main thing is to put the antibodies on the transducer surface and add your antigens. Uh, this is a very high affinity rich sensors, which is very, very sensitive and specific up till now. Uh, apart from this, we can also do the sensing of viruses uh, or the micro, uh, micro uh, biota like the bacteria or uh, the fungi also. I will give you some glimpse in uh, my uh, slides later on. So the enzyme-based sensors, as we know that enzyme has active sites, so it binds with its substrate. And once the enzyme-substrate interaction occurs, it leads to the formation of a product. These products sometimes release the electrons that can be detected by the um, electrochemical sensors. So how uh, we uh, diagnose or detect these things? So uh, then uh, the next thing comes into mind is the nanomaterial. So these nanomaterials, what nanomaterials we should use? It again depends upon the type of application you would like to develop. So for this, there are several thousands of nanomaterials are available in the market. You can also synthesize in the lab. So uh, I will give you a few examples out of that is the gold, gold nanoparticles, gold nanorods, silicon yes. nanoparticles, carbon nanotubes, fullerenes, graphene sheets, or the and, uh, graphene rods or quantum dots, iron oxide particles, silver particles, nanoflowers. So these are the several nanomaterials. Apart from this, there are thousands others. Uh, so it depends upon what kind of application we would like to develop on the basis of that we choose the nanomaterial in our application. So now the, uh, the next thing comes into picture, response from bioelements. What kind of response we, are, we would like to see from these bioelements? It depends whether we would like to, to, uh, to detect the heat absorbed or the movement of electrons, or we would like to detect the photons or the mass uh, on the electrode surface. On the basis of we design these different types of sensors, this could be electrochemical, optical, thermal, resonant, and ion sensitive. So what is the principle of electrochemical sensors? So as the name indicate electrochemical, so the chemical reactions that occurs uh, during the re, uh, uh, and it leads to the production or the consumption of the ions or electrons can lead to the uh, detection or in the form of the three different sensors further, which could be classified as amperometric, conductimetric, and potentiometric. As the name indicates, the amperometric uh, sensors uh, detect the electroactive species. As I told you, the enzyme 
uh, substrate reactions leads to the oxidation reduction and further leads to the release of the electrons that can be measured by their ferrometric sensors. Conductive metric sensors uh, measure the conductance uh, in the solution or the resistance in the solution, how it occurs basically. If we understand this is the nanomaterial which we put onto the transducer surface or uh, below that is the substrate and these nanomaterials are electroactive and then the, your protein also has some charge sometimes that we would like to see. So if the protein is positively charged, these, there will be repulsion. So the conductance will decrease over the period of time. And if you are using the n-type material, then the conductance will increase over the period of time. So uh, the next is the potentiometric sensor that in that measures the change in the voltage. This is the typical potential stat, uh, which uh, is being used as a potentiometric sensor. So here is the cell, uh, here is the electrochemical cell, which is very, very tiny. And here you can see all the three different kinds of electrodes are there in the solution. And we measure the chemical reaction in the potential stat and measure the change in the reactions. I, I'll explain this in the detail in the later uh, slides. Optical sensors are the sensors which measured the light. So how this occurs, basically it's an optical diffraction. So what is diffraction further? So the diffraction is the slight bending of the light at is, as it passes through the edge of an object. So it, uh, for this uh, diffraction uh, purpose, we use the optical device where we use the silicon wafers, where this protein-protein interaction occurs between the nanomaterial and the protein biological sample. And further, what we do is the photo masking uh, to protect the UV light. So whatever the region is exposed to the UV light will be uh, masked and uh, the unexposed region will uh, give us the, the, pro the, the values or we, what we would like to see. So the release of the photons out of that. So optical biosensors work like this. Uh, thermal biosensors. So in case of thermal sensors, what we measure is the absorption or the production of the heat. Uh, so uh, which in turn uh, lead to the changes in the temperature when the reaction takes place. So. We immobilize the enzymes and uh, the binding of this uh, substrate with the enzyme leads to the change in the temperature of the sensors, which is called as the thermistors. So these thermistors works on the basis of the total heat as absorbed and produced, which is called uh, as or is proportional to the enthalpy of the reaction. So, uh, on the basis of these, uh, the thermal um, thermal biosensors are not is uh, are not very popular because it has very limited applications and it is in, uh, insensitive to the optical and electrochemical reactions. Uh, ion sensitive sensors are the fat based sensors. What is fat? Fat is the field effect transistors. Uh, field effect transistors are nothing is the conductive matrix sensors, which is uh, we called as the semiconductor fats, which uh, carries the ion sensitive surface as we as I described in the previous slide. So the electrochemical potential changes on the surface of uh, these uh, wafers, which is the ion sensitive and lead to the liberation of the ions or the electrons on the on the interface of the semiconductor that we measure on the surface and uh, in the form, in the real time manner, actually we calculate the response. So what is cantilever based sensors? As I told you, the resonant, uh, resonance uh, based sensor or the mass based sensors. So if we would like to detect the change in the mass on the sensor surface, why mass? Because whenever you put any biomolecule, there is a change in the mass on the surface of the electrode. So in detail, if I would say that uh, this is our lab, uh, previous lab work, which we have done. So this is the uh, cantilever, which is made up of gold. This gold, as we know, is an inert and does not react with any protein or any biological molecule on its own. So for this, we, we introduced the reagent, which is called as SATA. Uh, we, in, we incubated the antibodies with the SATA to uh, generate the thiol group because uh, we know that the thiol binds with the gold. 
So with this, we uh, immobilize the antibodies on the uh, cantilever surface. And later when, as you can see, there is a still uh, deflection or bending of the cantilever due to change in the mass on its surface. And each bending can be seen in the form of a graph, as you can see from here. So when you add your antigens, there is a further bending. So increase in the antigen concentration leads to more bending. So due to which you see the more deflection on its surface. With this deflection, we measure the pesticide concentration in this uh, sample. So uh, next is the piezoelectric sensor that also we have fabricated uh, in our previous laboratory, which is uh, uh, piezoelectric sensors, how it works. This, the, uh, this uh, looks like this. This is the cantilever. Uh, this is the piezoelectric uh, electrode, which is again made up of gold in the center, which is in yellow color. So this is the metal electrode and this is a quartz wafer. On this quartz wafer, we uh, created the electrode and uh, we measure the uh, deformation or the uh, frequency change on the electrode surface. So when we insert this uh, electrode here, what happened the, after immobilization of each uh, biomolecules, there is a change in the frequency on the electrode surface, which we measure in the terms of uh, uh, Hertz, changes in the Hertz. So this is another sensor, which is called as SPR based sensors, which is surface plasmon resonance based sensors. These are the plasmons or we say it uh, electrons. Uh, which uh, uh, released when there is an interaction of these uh, proteins or the biomolecules occurs on the uh, sensor surface. So when we hit the light source through the polarized light and here we placed a prism, what happened then there is the diffraction occurs, the, to the light is totally reflected uh, and the angle uh, through which it get detected is called the optical detection unit and uh, the whole uh, uh, scheme uh, depends upon the kind of biomolecule we immobilize and it is a real time detection which we measure. However, this technique is not uh, very conventional. It is a conventional technique and not very, very popular because uh, of its uh, constraints is very, very expensive and time consuming and it requires a trained person to operate it. So what are the application of these nano sensors? The, ap the application is huge. The, you name it, you can test it. You can diagnose it. Uh, whether you would like to develop point of care sensors for uh, detecting blood, urine, electrolytes, gases, or steroids, drugs, hormones, proteins, or you would like to develop a cell-based sensors for any uh, bacterial disease or enzyme-based sensors or DNA sensors for genetic monitoring. In, in agriculture area, there is also a lot of applications in the food sector. So if you have any spoiled food products or you would like to check the nutritional value of any uh, product, you can develop the sensor for that. You can check the uh, quality control parameters by developing a diagnostic uh, devices. And uh, yes, it has also a value in the screening of antibiotics and because it's a lot of secretion of the antibiotics in milk. So that also can be tested by using the sensors. And also it has a huge application in environmental screening because there is a lot of pollution, toxicity and groundwater monitoring, ocean monitoring because uh, pollution is there everywhere. So we can use this in environmental applications too. Uh, when we talk about the diseases, it has the role there also. We can, uh, uh, we can test any disease. Uh, this is an example of a cancer. So we can also develop the antibodies for cancer, uh, which is specific to certain biomarkers and can test it or uh, by using the peptides or any aptamas or so. This is uh, another thing. So uh, for the diabetes, which is the, uh, I mean, the biosensors uh, has been playing a very important role in diagnosing the diabetes in India and abroad, because we know that this is the most prevalent disease in, uh, and 52% of the Indians are, are actually unaware that they are suffering from this disease. So uh, it is uh, very important to develop a new products. So what, how it works, it is, it is called as, first of all, is the glucose uh, sensor. Sorry, 
uh, glucose sensor. So how it works? Uh, so glucose reacts with the glucose oxidase and results in the production of the gluconic acid. So this reaction leads to the production of the two electrons and two protons. So um, uh, what it does, so this GOD, which is the gluconic uh, uh, acid or reacts with the more glucose if the if the person is uh, highly diabetic so there will be more glucose it will react and produce this uh, uh, god more and uh, later it will be the more production of the electrons so on the basis of that it can be detected by the electrochemical sensor with this principle the another sensor was developed which is uh, uh, based upon the quantum dots quantum dots are the fluorescent molecules that can be uh, uh, that can be uh, developed uh, by uh, fluorescence method, but uh, the problem is that with the quantum dots uh, that it quenches with the time. So uh, this was not so successful sensor in this case. So then the up till now, what are the commercially available sensors for the glucose is the finger stick testing, where uh, if uh, someone has to test uh, the blood glucose uh, level throughout the day, then this is the best method that you just prick your finger and uh, put it on the electrode and it will give you the level of glucose that you have. So this is a finger stick testing method that is developed by the, with the Lancet. And there are some of the subdermal implants also developed. And uh, recently the smart contact lens also developed for this uh, uh, glucose monitoring and uh, this is another machine which is called as the GlucoTrack, uh, which is based upon the uh, ultrasonic uh, and uh, electromagnetic and heat capacity. So this can be uh, put into the, your ear clip and it has a lifespan of uh, around six months. Then the Symphony company also developed this kind of uh, skin transdermal sensor, which you can stick onto your skin and it can tell you the readings uh, over the period of time, uh, but it has again a short span life uh, around for 24 to 48 hours. So if you see the picture, this is very, uh, I mean, I can say it's not the complete picture of sensors. So the simplest example is the pH meter, which is in daily routine we use, and it can also used for the infectious diseases like uh, uh, TB or uh, pregnancy diagnostic is the uh, the very uh, simple example that we can do in home. And uh, these are the different kinds of diagnostic sensors, chips that you can implant into your skin and can test the level of uh, pH or metabolites or hormones over the period of time. Then uh, I would give you a simple uh, little bit uh, glimpse of our lab now, what we do. So if you have any question or you would like to work with us, you are, you are most welcome. So uh, this is the uh, kind of work which suppose it's a biomolecule, which is, a, which is uh, we would like to generate something out of it. So as you can see there, it has a lot of functional group. So we have to see that uh, how we can make it functional to uh, make it useful for our purpose. So for this, we do the biomolecules modification where the expertise of the chemist came into the picture. Then we also developed the nucleic acid-based assays that also can be uh, say as uh, aptamer-based assay or the DNA-based assays. In that, we developed the microfluidic devices or the naked eye detection and the CRISPR-based assays. Then we also develop the antibodies and generate uh, and develop the immunoassays and develop LFA devices. And uh, apart from this, we also work on the fabrication of FET devices and uh, uh, where uh, we uh, fabricate the device that I will explain. And uh, another uh, area is the targeting or the therapeutics where uh, we, uh, we make the nanoconjugates or the nanocarrier uh, vehicles for the a drug delivery and targeting in uh, cells. So uh, this is uh, this is the concept that I told you that how this biosensor works. So suppose this is the biomolecule which we would like to modify and we have modified the biomolecules now and we conjugated it with the proteins and it is ready. We can characterize it with uh, various methods like uh, electrophoresis method or the fluorescence methods 
and the mass spectroscopy, and then we use the animals to raise the antibodies and develop the immunoassays. So this is one aspect with the biomolecules. And this is the kind of assays that we develop. Like this is the fluorescence-based assay. This is the enzyme-based assays that we develop. And you can see the sensitivity of each assay varies from one to the other. So it all depends on how you would like to develop. So this is another method. Uh, these are the IgY antibodies, as you have heard about the IgG antibodies. Up till now, we have used, but we have also developed the IgY antibodies in the chicken in uh, past. So uh, advantage of these antibodies is that it is highly, highly stable because in IgY structure, you can see there is a single uh, extra CH2 domain which is absent in the IgG. So it is more stable, more, more highly thermostable also. You can uh, transport it at higher uh, temperature where in the air regions where the temperature is a little high. So with this, we fabricated the LFA device uh, and you can see we have done some characterization by UV spectroscopy and the transmission electron microscopy. And we would uh, come up with the uh, detection limit of uh, around 9.8 or you can say around 10 nanograms per ml. So. Uh, then what we have done, we have also developed the uh, microfluidic device by using the polymer PDMS. So in this scheme, what we have done, we have used the carbon nanotubes and demobilized the antibodies. And we have used uh, various schemes for the optimization to get the highest signal. So with this, uh, what we achieved is the, these are the AFM images because whenever you do something, anything in the application work, you have to first do all the characterization to see whether what you are doing is correct or not. So for that, we have done the AFM to see whether the nanotubes are binding to the, the, the polymer and uh, the proteins are immobilizing or not. Then we have done the fluorescence uh, a spectroscopy studies of all the material that we synthesized and we have done the CD spectroscopy to see the changes in the uh, protein structures. After that, we have done some sensing studies, whether we are getting a response or not. You can see the graph is going down, which means that, that we are getting a signal. While in this case, when we use the standard protein, we were not getting the signal. So what we have done further, we have done some of the informatics work where we have used the native BSA uh, together with the CNT. Uh, then what we have done, we have also used the carboxylated CNTs, which we have interacted with the protein and see the changes in the structural components. We can see after uh, binding with of the BSA with the carboxylated CNTs, the, the, there is a huge change in the structure and that lead to the uh, uh, fabrication of the device. These are the steps where, where we have uh, developed the device. And then we were able to detect with this around uh, 100 femtograms per ml of the antigen. Then uh, what we have done, another method we have developed in the lab is the phage library. So we know that bacteriophages are the, the, the phages uh, which uh, displace the proteins on its surface but it is very, very tedious. It requires a lot of patience because you have to do a lot of screening and panning rounds to uh, find out the bound phages. Uh, with this, what we have done, we have selected the library and from that library, we have find out the suitable clones. Uh, these are the, you can see the highest high binders. So we have done a lot of uh, rounds up to around, I think 50 rounds we have done of each and then we have uh, selected the high affinity binders and uh, then we have characterized and sequenced it and uh, developed the lateral flow device for that. And uh, the beauty of this uh, is that in comparison to polyclonal, it has the specificity um, uh, comparable to monoclonal and it recognizes the molecules very, very specifically. So now we've uh, discussed uh, about the pesticides because we know that pesticides are very, very harmful toxic substances that really uh, affects our health. It can cause the cancer or reproductive disorders, neurological disorders or neurodevelopmental disorders in kids. So it is very, very important because it persists in the soil up to several weeks or up to years. How it enters into the ecosystem is 
how it enters into the ecosystem. So uh, you can see the farmers is spraying in the field and we do not know uh, because farmers are not the educated persons. So they add large amount of pesticide in the water and then mix it. They do not know what is the permissible limit, how much I have to mix in the water. So they mix it, uh, I mean, as they want to just kill the pest or the um, insects. So uh, with this, it enters into the soil and then it goes to the aquatic flora and fauna. And then when these crops absorb these pesticides, it enters into the food chain and hence it enters into the human body through the, through the food, water, and then it enters into the environment. So this is the process. So there are various uh, LODs or the limit of detection set by the, the authorities, but uh, no one follows that in principle. So uh, these are the different kinds of uh, sensors uh, for atrazine we have developed. As I uh, spoke in the previous slide, this is the cantilever-based sensor, which we developed for the atrazine. It, it works on the basis of change in the mass or the deflection beam. And this is the chlorpyrifos sensor, which is based upon the FET, why how we fabricated it. Uh, fabricated it uh, is the uh, graphene is first exfoliated on the sub substrate and then we created the uh, we use the lithography procedure to create it the gates and then we mobilize the proteins on it and the, and recorded the response over the period of time in the real time manner. Uh, likewise, we also developed the PDMS based device. Uh, which is called as the microfluidic device for the 2,4-D pesticide. And uh, in this case, the detection limit was observed around 50 picomoles, picomolars. And uh, this is the another uh, electrochemical sensor, which is based upon the potential state, as I have shown you in a previous slide. In this, we have used the F specific electrode, which is FTO, and we use the nanomaterial as per our requirement, and uh, we mobilize the antibodies and the antigens and tested it. You cannot believe it. We have uh, simply purchased the fruits and vegetables from the market, pomegranate, cabbage, and apple. Uh, so the, the pesticide, which is banned uh, in India, it was present in uh, really in these uh, fruits and vegetables. So I was surprised if it is banned, why, how they are using it. So we get, went to the market uh, and find out that this, yes, this pesticide is there, which is really now un, in supply to the farmers still, even it is banned. So uh, with this, we also uh, developed some of the uh, sensors for the disease. Uh, disease uh, biomarkers, which is the HIV, CTN1, and RA is the arthritis. So HIV, as we know, it is uh, some, sometimes it is associated as the uh, with the cardiovascular diseases. So in the cardiovascular diseases, CTN1 is the biomarker which is associated with the HIV. And due to this, sometimes this is the arthritis is the symptom that occurs. Uh, so uh, we developed the F. F FET-based sensors for that uh, with the same method. And uh, we characterize the device uh, before and after by checking the gate voltage of it. Uh, so it, it does not change. Then we have also tested uh, the current, which, whether it is coming from the biomolecule or through the, uh, uh, through the gold, because there is the gold in, the, in this device. And then we have checked the, uh, the, the stability of these device over the period of weeks and uh, characterize the, this is, you can see, this is the graphene, which is a very thin uh, thread-like structure. This is your nanomaterial, which we use, and these are the electrodes, which is made up of gold. So then we have done some microscopy and then the, did the real-time sensing, where we found out that in HIV, the limit of detection was around 100 femtograms, and uh, in case of, uh, CTN1, it was 10 femtograms, and in uh, arthritis, it was around 1 femtograms per ml. 
So uh, then in the next sensor, which we uh, worked on is the JEV, which is Japanese encephalitis virus. Uh, in this case, we uh, raised the, uh, we, we made the clone and we raised the antibodies. Then we have done the ELISA and compared it with the commercially available antigen antibodies. And we find out, uh, found the very good binding um, with the limit of detection around 0.25 micrograms per ml. With this, we again fabricated the FET device and we have done all the characterization. You can see this is the optical uh, image of the sens um, sensor. This is again the SAM and this is the AFM. With this, you can see there is the change in the height of, or of around 1.22 nanometers. And then we have characterized the, the device also. You can see in the inside, this is the device. This is how tiny it looks like. It's like your um, SIM, the micro mini SIM, very small SIM, which you put in your phone and this is the stability parameters. Then we have characterized it with the UV, Raman, FTIR and SAM at all the steps and the real time sensing was done. Uh, in this case, the LOD was around 10 femtomolar. The next study, what we have done, I have shown you in the lab overview about the aggregation-based assays. So what we have done in this, we have uh, used very simple concept of the particles. So when there is a presence of mycotoxins, mycotoxins are again fungal toxins that are present in the food samples. So when these food samples are given to the animals, the, so if the limit cross, uh, then there is that there could be the death of the animal also. And also there are a lot of reports about the reproductive failure in, uh, in case of animals as well as the humans. So it is uh, simply uh, harmful uh, for ingestion at a higher uh, amount. So uh, with, for this, we developed the aptamer based assays. So these are, these are the black, uh, these are the things which are the aptamas surrounded with the particles. So when you add your uh, specific um, uh, molecule, which is your aflatoxin uh, M1, then it uh, these aptamers has the affinity for these aflatoxins M1 and it gets displaced from the particles and the change in the color becomes blue. Uh, so for this, we have done a lot of characterization. I will not go in these uh, details because it's not the, so this is the part which is important to understand this is the microfluidic device this which we make in this we created three different zones the sample zone detection zone and the control zone so in the detection zone what we have done we immobilize the particles with the aptamas and we put the sample here so when we put the milk without aflatoxin then there is no change in the uh, uh, control zone and the detection zone the color is become pink which is the color of the particles but when we, we, we put the milk with a flatoxin, there is a change in the color. The color turned to become purple. While in the control zone, there is no change in the color. <laughs> then, uh, if time permits, uh, I would explain a few more uh, ideas. This is the... This is the uh, particles, which is known as the magnetic nanoparticles. So these magnetic nanoparticles have a lot of wide variety of applications in targeting diagnosis and therapy. So uh, with this, with this uh, idea, what we uh, do that we have done the uh, imaging, which is, uh, uh, which is a very advanced version of imaging, which is called as the magnetic particle imaging. As we know, MRI. And as we know that MRI is the magnetic resonance imaging, so which is uh, quite expensive and uh, sometimes harmful also, uh, we do uh, repetitively. So MPI is the um, uh, new version of modality version of the MRI. Uh, so where we use these particles because MPI uh, is, is having a greater sensitivity uh, and the, the, the compound which we use in this case is uh, less harmful for the body. So, which is called as the safe biocompatible tracer as compared to the uh, gado uh, linear tracer. So, uh, what we have done for this, uh, we have also done the uh, diagnosis of the cancer uh, using the uh, receptor. So, this is the urokinase plasminogen activator receptor that overexpressed in the case of cancer. So, we use the antibodies as a platform and you can see this is the electrode where we put the nanomaterial uh, 
uh, with the graphene nanosheets and the antibodies uh, were uh, immobilized on that. And uh, uh, we put the antigen, which is UPA. UPA binds with the UPAR very, uh, with very high affinity. With this, we fabricated the sensor and have done a lot of characterization. Like UV and DLS and FTIR. And we have done the uh, microscopic analysis at each step. And this is the electrochemical uh, sensing at each step. So you can see in case of pair, there is uh, less uh, response while uh, I think someone is unmuted. Uh, so it's uh, disturbance is coming. <laughs> So you can see there is a change in the electrochemical response here at each step. So we have an for the optimization of the device. And we have to detect up to 10 femtomolar fubar antigen in this case. So this is the activatable nanosensor which we made. So the beauty of this nanosensor is that we put the biotin at both 5 prime and 3 prime end, and we put uh, the uh, Protease recognition site in the middle of this um, because in the cancer stage, what happened? These proteases uh, secretes at higher amount, and these proteases have a specific recognition site. So in this case, what we use, we use the trypsin protease, which cleaves at lysine and arginine of the carboxy terminal, while the matrix metalloprotease uh, protease cleaves at leucine. So uh, with this, we designed this peptide and what we have done, uh, we, have, uh, we have used these iron oxide particles. We have labeled this with the neutravidin as we know that there is an interaction between the neutravidin and biotin. What happened? These peptides bind with each other and it leads to the aggregation of the particles. Aggregation of the particles leads to the decrease of the ampere signal. So uh, while you add the cells expressing the material, then it cleaves the peptides in the middle, which leads to the, um, to the revival of the ampere signal and the signal goes up and the particles get dispersed. So this is a very simple method we developed. Another method is the uh, crossing the blood-brain barrier. As we know, in the case of a brain tumor, uh, the lactoferrin receptors ex expresses on the, the brain cells. So what we are, these are the transferrin receptors that bind to the lactoferrin. And these lactoferrin can cross the blood-brain barrier. With this idea, what we have done, we have with the lactoferrin receptors and we have characterized it and... We have done a few of the images we have seen that, that the electroferrin concentrated particles showed the higher uptake as compared to the, the uh, non-conjugated particles. So that the MPI signal goes up. Another study what we have done, we have used the peptides for the same as we know that the UPA receptor binds with the uh, with the uh, uh, UPA and vitronectin. So uh, these peptides, these are the peptide sequence that were conjugated with the fluorescent molecule. This is the polymer, uh, which helps further in the conjugation. And this is the UPA receptor. You can see it's binding very nicely. And this is the uptake. For this, we have done few of the in silico analysis to see whether this peptide is binding in the pocket of UPAR or not. And then we have done uh, the uh, characterization by uh, different methods to see uh, the binding mechanism is happening or not. Then we have seen, um, uh, we have observed that uh, is there any uptake uh, of these peptides in the cells or not. So we have done some of the cell adhesion experiments. We know that these UPAR cells binds with the vitronectin, which is the extracellular matrix protein, and it leads to the increase uh, uh, in the binding of the cells and once you add these peptides you can see the cell uh, cell does not proliferate so which shows that these peptides are very effective and can be used as the efficient imaging tool you can see these gfd and smb peptides bind with very high affinity as compared to the controls or the smb and for the same we have done the facts analysis also sorry yeah so nice yes yes Please mute your microphone. It is disturbing so, actually. Please, please mute your microphones. Yeah, Abhijit, I am over. So, so with this, I would like to acknowledge. Uh,
uh, my students uh, and uh, my uh, institute who supported me and uh, SERB, DBT, DST, and Indian Academy of Sciences, INEAS, which is the body of INSA, and Australian Academy of Sciences for helping me uh, and uh, to carry out the research. And uh, if you have any questions, I have any questions, you can write to me whenever you would like to write. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah, Abhijit, yes. Yeah, if you have any questions, please ask Dr. Sonia. First of all, please mute your microphone. I think so. there is a lot of background noise coming. May I request the the live admin to please mute the microphones? Yeah, if you have questions, please ask to Dr. Solo. There is one so person who has raised her hand, Rashid. Rashid. You can also write your question in the chat box if you have, if you are not able to communicate. Can I ask the question? Sure, sir. Okay. So, no, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. You know, you, it was a wonderful uh, to hear your uh, applied uh, uh, science lecture. You know, it was like going through a series of discoveries and invention. So uh, my question is that, you know, the, the household uh, uh, meter that we use, right? The household meter. you talked about it, right? In the So what is the principle used there? I mean, basically, in a very layman term, how do we measure the glucose? So it is basic. It is uh, basically the enzyme and uh, substrate reaction. So when this, uh, as I told in my previous slide, uh, as you can see. I should I should I share this slide again? No, no, it's okay. Just tell tell me, you know, in the wire. Yeah. So if uh, you have the glucose amount in your body, then uh, then it uh, reacts uh, with the glucose oxidase. And it forms the gluconic acid. And in this process, the uh, two electrons and electrons are so with this, That is how we measure. So it is basically the uh, electrochemical sensor that uh, when we use the uh, blood, uh, prick the finger and put the blood sample on the electrode. So uh, it measures the electrons flow through the channel of the electrodes. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, so now I have a, one question. I mean, it was a very interesting talk. So uh, 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 there is an inherent, uh, uh, I know uh, the microfluidic system work very well for uh, diagnosis of many things, uh, but there is an inherent drawback of the system vis-a-vis uh, -vis to the clinical sample, right? Because then the purity comes into the picture. So uh, that's why they are not uh, that popular in for detecting the uh, infectious agent in the clinical sample. So what is your say? Because most of the times these uh, clinical samples react with these matrices, right? And uh, uh, and then this complete integrated system, uh, it becomes very difficult. So lab on chip, uh, that the concept is not that popular for infectious diseases. So I mean, people say that there are a long way to go for this, uh, this uh, for infectious diseases. 
Yeah, I think it is not only for infectious diseases, it is for all the applications. So, because right now, up till now, what we are doing is uh, pre-treatment of the sample, right? Okay. So, uh, without that, it is really very difficult because in uh, the whole scenario, if, even if you do your, uh, your Western, so there you also uh, sonicate your cells. In that, lot of things come out from the cells. It is same here also. When you use your uh, um, raw sample, and then if you don't pre-treat it, then there is a lot of other things that will interfere or interact with your uh, sample. So that will again give you the false positive results. So I think um, in this case, what I would suggest, if there is no way out, I think pre-treatment is the best thing that up till now we can do. What we can do is that to uh, shorten the time period for the testing, how we can do that? I think we should design some of the reagents that requires less time for the pre-treatment of the sample. That could be the way out of it. Because it works very well for the uh, kind of a pristine samples. Where, you know, you have a pure purity of samples, but uh, when it uh, comes to the clinical samples, uh, for example, pus, urine, blood, uh, or serum, then uh, the specificity and sensitivity uh, go down. It goes down. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes. So that's what we, we also realize. Yes. So that's what they say, lab on cheap concept for infectious diseases, there is a long way to go, at least five, six years. Right. Uh, we'll have to. Still, because there are uh, kind of a ELISA, it's a gold standard test in many, even you, many even, diseases. Even if you talk about the RT-PCR also, there is a, also a pre-treatment step. You okay. cannot, so that also kills even a lot of uh, RT-PCR kits that has been in the market uh, uh, for COVID. That also, uh, they have also done the pre-treatment step in that. That itself is around one hour to 1.5 hours. So, <laughs> So yeah, which, what we, uh, what for these can... microfluidic things, so uh, which one is better? This is label-free uh, detection or labeled detection? Actually, a uh, label detection uh, is better than the label-free. Okay. Yeah. okay. And is there even any way to amplify the signal? Yeah, uh, amplification of because the signal. Because in most of the cases, we are looking at uh, the real-time interactions, right? So there is no amplifying the signal. So if you amplify the signal, we might uh, improve the sensitivity. Yeah, so for that, uh, yes. Uh, but that cannot be, that will be, I mean, again, will be a long way to go if you talk about the field applicability. Mm -hmm. Because then it, it, can, it is very difficult to say it will be field yeah. applicable. Mm -hmm. So uh, see, this, these are the limitations with the different kinds of sensors. That's mm -hmm. what I said. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to design as per your need. If you would like to go in the field, then it will be a different sensor. Mm -hmm. If you would like to develop in the lab, it will be a different sensor. Uh, future is good, but I think there are a lot of standardizations uh, to be done for. It is required, instance, yes. yes, yes. Yeah. So I think there is one question, Sony, in the chat box. Could you please explain about which software you use for docking? So I'm not clear which uh, in which uh, concern uh, the student is asking docking. I think it's Lo Logeshwari. Uh, no, but uh, for this sensor purpose, we do not use any software. Logeshri, are you around? You can ask your question to Dr. Sono.
which is too shy to ask it in person we have to deal with the written part i think uh, if uh, for the sensor purpose we do i think she is um, asking a general uh, docking software one so, uh, as i mean i have shown only docking software in my last slide where i have shown some targeting studies so there i use the plus pro software but for sensor purpose there is no software that we are using okay i think if there are no more questions uh, we can conclude this because i don't see any question in the, in the chat box too okay thank you dr sono i it was a fantastic talk i think uh, uh, you, you do a lot of uh, 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 this is diagnostic uh, for many diseases and it was very difficult for you to cover all of them but you tried your best and give a glimpse of each and every diagnostic as the which you have developed the lab uh, it was very fantastic to see that uh, no way. okay so uh, if you want if you want to see more uh, no question okay so if you are interested in her lab uh, for doing a master program or for phd please visit at an ib website you will find more details about her and uh, you can just go through her profile uh, and you can approach her for uh, master training because she takes student for uh, six month dissertation master dissertation and also phd so if you are interested to visit to an ib website and do visit on dr sono's uh, profile so thank you everyone thank you for, for attending this talk thank you so much thank you so much thank you thank you abhijit okay thanks bye